awesome. Hey, welcome to church. Glad to have you in the house of God uh, with us this evening. I wanted to make you aware uh, of a couple things. Number one is this. Next Sunday, next Sunday, which will be May 26th, uh, we're doing something uh, called Membership Sunday here uh, at Pursuit, giving people an opportunity uh, who are part of our community to officially sign up as members here in the house of God. If you have yet to do that, we're going to encourage you to text the word uh, membership to 33200. Uh, and in doing so, we'd love to have you officially part of the team here uh, at Pursuit as we are building a house for the Lord, a dwelling place for his glory, a place for people to encounter and be transformed by the power and presence of Jesus. And we'd love to have you along for that journey. We've got a special gift uh, next week for all of our new members. And uh, if you have yet to uh, sign up, we'd sure love to have you uh, a part of the team. Again, you can do that by texting the word membership to 33200. It'll be a short form for you to fill out. And uh, we'll be glad to have you. Hey, at the conclusion uh, of tonight's service, uh, this uh, short book I wrote, In, in Pursuit of the uh, Spirit, it's a, a manual, a handbook on what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and some encouragement and, and ways to continue to develop that relationship with God's Spirit that dwells inside of you. These are gonna be made available for people in the foyer after service. Love for you to pick up a copy. I think especially on nights like this, as I'm gonna be teaching in specific on this subject, this could be a great resource for your life, a tool for discipleship and development. Those will be available after service in the foyer. Would love to have you uh, pick one up or grab one for a friend uh, or a family member. Let me just explain uh, real briefly uh, this evening kind of the format for what's gonna take place over the next number of minutes. Uh, I'm gonna share with you uh, out of scripture on the necessity of God's spirit being active, indwelling and infilling in your life in ways that promote you and prompt you into a supernatural partnership with God for the redeeming of the world uh, around you. Uh, when I think about salvation, I don't think about it as just something that God does in us, for us, or on our behalf, but instead as a divine invitation into the plan and the prerogative of God that has been stamped on your life from the moment that he formed you within your mother's womb. And I believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a key integral part in you, not just being a convert who makes heaven, but a disciple who makes history. I believe the most significant moment in your life on this side of eternity is the moment that you confess faith in Christ Jesus and you were born again into the family of God. I think the second most powerful and profound moment in the life of a believer is when they're baptized in God's Holy Spirit, they are endued with power from on high. And then they are elevated to the stage of history to make a difference with their God-given giftedness in the world around them. I operate with the conviction that we owe the region an encounter with God. But how can I bring an encounter to the world unless I have been encountered myself? And the baptism of the Holy Spirit is about you having an encounter yourself. Not just words on a paper or verses on a screen or theology that you memorize from a textbook but an encounter with God's Holy Spirit that fundamentally transforms the way that you think about the days which are ahead. I truly believe that if God by his own spirit could get a hold of the hearts and minds of just a couple dozen young adults in this region, that Seattle would have no idea what is coming for it. That if people could just think like God thinks about the world around them and the time in which they live, that if they were to operate with Holy Spirit initiative and mandate, that God would use simple faith and simple obedience to transform the very landscape of this region. And as we're talking about and sharing on these biblical concepts tonight, my goal is not to answer all of your questions, but instead to pique your curiosity because there is a gift that God gives those who are waiting on him and it's the gift of hunger. And hunger will drive you places that all the best sermons in the world never could. What hunger will do is it will motivate you to seek the Lord while he may be found, to search him out, to study for yourself, to show yourself approved, a workman worthy of his hire. It'll cause you to have a lifetime of upward spiritual mobility by which your trajectory of following Jesus continues to grow and increase with every day that he continues to give breath in, in your lungs. And my hope tonight is that what we will experience as a community and as individuals all across this room 
won't be like a finite moment of time or, or even like the end of the journey for you, but instead the beginning of a brand new chapter of working and functioning with the Lord as a co-labor and a co-heir of God in Christ Jesus, partnering with him and allowing yourself to be a conduit of his power and his anointing in the world around you. I want to contend for the baptism of the Holy Spirit this evening from three primary perspectives. The first is historical. The second is theological or scriptural. And the third is, is practical. And, and I hope by the time that we conclude this service tonight that you remain as convinced as I am that we need the power of God's Spirit in our lives more today than we have ever needed it before. Let me start here. The Holy Spirit is not an it. It's not a vibe. It's not a feeling you get by rubbing two crystals together that you bought at TJ Maxx. <clears throat> it's not an aura. It's not a mist. It's not a gong. It's not a symbol. It's not an emotion that you feel in a particularly turned up or stirred up charismatic environment. The Holy Spirit is a person. He can be grieved. He can be mocked. He can be ignored or he can be welcomed. The choice is yours. At Pursuit Seattle, the Holy Spirit is not just invited. He's welcomed, he's wanted, he's desired. Because if you get the presence, you get everything else. And if you don't get the presence of God, it don't matter what else you got. As a core doctrine, Christians affirm the Trinitarian nature of God. The belief in one God made manifest in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We view them as co-equal, co-eternal, and consubstantial. Although the word Trinity is never mentioned in Scripture, the concept of a triune Godhead is clearly presented all throughout Scripture from Genesis all the way through to the book of Revelation. There are two main positions today on the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the usage of gifts. The first position is cessationism. It means to cease. The second position is continuation. It means to continue. The cessationist position purports that the gifts of the Holy Spirit were primarily active during the apostolic age of the first century and were used to confirm the authority and authenticate the witness of the biblical authors. Cessationists would say that these gifts were necessary for the founding of the New Testament church, but are no longer needed as the church has already been established and the canon already closed. Although God is still sovereign and divine acts of providence may still occur at random times and in random places, the usage of gifts, especially the sign gifts of tongues, healing, and prophecy are no longer active and available in the life of believers today. Cessationism came to prominence in a modern sense shortly after the Protestant Reformation, primarily as a reactionary theological polemic against the purported miracles of the Roman Catholic Church. Luther, along with his merry band of reformers, who are rightfully upset over the selling of indulgences and the abuse of papal authority, nailed 95 complaints to the door of All Saints Church in Wittenberg, Germany on October 31st, 1517. Luther's complaints, which were related to the centralization of religious power and the rampant theological abuse of the clergy, spread like wildfire across Western Europe and would become the rallying cry for a new generation of disaffected former Catholics. Whether or not Luther intended for the Reformation to result in a permanent and wide-reaching schismatic fracture is still of great debate, but nonetheless, the declaration of by faith alone, by grace alone, and by scripture alone would forever change the Christian religious landscape. And though as a Protestant, I am obviously thankful for the Reformation, I am aware of the temptation of the pedagogical pendulum to swing from one end of the spectrum to the other. In simpler terms, we tend to throw out the baby with the bathwater. The abuses of the Catholic Church sent the reformers running in the opposite direction, including in areas of pneumatological importance, specifically signs, wonders, and miracles. 
Calvin, who was a contemporary of Luther, would author a letter to the king of France in 1536 addressing the lack of miracles associated with the Protestant Reformation. Calvin would make the point that since the message of the Reformation was not a new teaching, but instead a calling back to the historic orthodoxy of the church, it did not require miracles to validate its messaging. But we are not cessationists we are continuationists. The continuationist position supports the notion that the gifts of the Holy Spirit were not time limited, were not exclusively available to the apostolic authors, did not exclusively exist just to validate apostolic teaching, and did not end with the closing of the canon. Instead, these gifts, both ordinary and spectacular, are freely available to believers today, and they serve as a contemporary and ongoing witness that validates the reality and the power of the church. The continuous position... The continuationist position was affirmed by church fathers such as Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Origen, and others. St. Augustine, who was famously cessationist earlier in his life, had a change of heart by the time he wrote his famous book, The City of God, as he adopted a continuationist position stating that he simply could not ignore the sheer volume of miracles that were occurring around him. The presence of miracles... And the focus on spiritual giftedness and practice would ebb and flow throughout church history with some seasons of intensity and other seasons of seeming indifference. However, 200 years after the Reformation, two brothers named John and Charles Wesley, alongside other figures like George Whitfield, would come on the scene in England and lead a reformation of their own with an emphasis on personal holiness, entire sanctification, and a renewed focus on the inner working of God's spirit with manifestations of power, the Methodist movement would be born. What began as a student club at a university in Oxford, England would spread and splinter around the globe into a worldwide movement of spirit-filled churches and Christians who operated with the belief that the Holy Spirit continued to work in the lives of believers and the gifts are for today. By some estimations, the charismatic movement numbers upwards of 700 million today. You are a part of the fastest growing religious movement ever in world history. A movement of believers who are daring themselves to take scripture seriously, to believe that the God that we serve changes not. He's the same God yesterday as he is today, as he will be forever. The Holy Spirit is for today. And in Luke 11, Jesus tells his disciples a parable that illustrates in brilliant fashion what it looks like to pursue the work, the role, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You might be here tonight and be thinking, well, if God wants me to have it, he'll just give it to me. But the reality is, is that anything in life that you desire, you have developed the ability to pursue. If God just wanted me to have a job, he'd give one to me. No, you had to fill out an application. If God wanted me to have a girlfriend, he'd just give one to me. No, you had to shower. If God wanted me to have a promotion, if God wanted me to have an education... The question is not, does God want you to have it? It's, do you want you to have it? And I refuse to ascribe to a theological agnosticism that pretends that God is not as interested in intervening in the affairs of humanity today as he has been in past seasons. I'm more convinced today than ever that we need the raw, unfiltered, unmitigated outpouring of God's power to rescue people out of darkness, to break chains of addiction off of people's lives, to heal their minds, their bodies, to forgive their sin. We need the power of the Holy Ghost. Luke 11, Jesus tells this story. Jesus said to them, verse five, suppose you have a friend 
Suppose you have a friend. You know, the Holy Spirit is referred to as a friend. He's referred to as a paraclete, which means the helper. He is the one who empowers you for a life of service and Christ followership. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and said, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers and says, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, these are the words of Jesus. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? And in fact, Jesus goes on to say, you have not because you ask not. (laughs) I think a lot of believers are waiting on a God who for a long time has been waiting on them. (laughs) And I would dare you tonight to ask God for everything that he's got for your life and watch him show up in power that confounds human reasoning, that bypasses intellectual understanding, that speaks to the very spirit that resides inside of you and fills your cup to overflowing. In scripture, there are three baptisms. And I'm gonna show you tonight the necessity of each. In the Greek, the word baptism is baptizo. It means to be fully immersed and submerged until an individual is overwhelmed by that which they are being baptized into. Let me say it again. It means to be fully immersed and submerged until an individual is overwhelmed by that which they are being baptized into. Which means this, when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, it ain't dipping your toes in the water. It's not visiting a drive through on your way home. It is a giving over of the title deed of your life. It is a surrendering to the work, the way, and the will of God for your destiny. It is a rendering of your spirit and your soul unto service of the King. It's saying, God, I want everything that you got. I'm holding nothing back. And I don't just want a little oil on my head. I want my cup to overflow. I want the oil to come on my head, drip down my face, collect at the hem of my garment. I want everything that you have for me. You have not because you ask not. Scripture speaks to three distinct baptisms in the life of a believer. Each of them are important yet separate moments in your spiritual walk with God. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Jesus. Wrong slide. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Jesus and into the body of Christ. After salvation, water baptism is a public proclamation declaring the old life has been buried and your new life in Christ Jesus has begun. When you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you are receiving power from on high to carry out the mission of God in and through your life. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Jesus. After salvation, water baptism is a public proclamation declaring your old life has been buried, your new life has come. And when you get baptized into the Holy Spirit, you are receiving power from on high to carry out the mission of God in and through your life. Watch what the Bible says, Matthew 3 and 11. 
I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. These are the words of John the Baptist as he is baptizing people under repentance in the Jordan River, preparing the way of the Lord, declaring, I am not the Messiah, but the Messiah is coming. He is the lamb who will be slain to take away the sin of the world. And when he baptizes you, it won't just be in water. It'll be with fire for the transformation of your life. Acts 1, Jesus says this, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. I want you to notice it wasn't the maybe of the Father. It wasn't if I like you of the Father. It wasn't if you pass a spiritual gift test from the Father. It was the promise of the Father. Acts 19, and it happened while Paulus was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. <clears throat> when Paul heard this, he laid hands on them and prayed for them. The Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in new tongues and prophesied. Acts 8, but when they believed, which is salvation, Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. When they believed... That's their baptism into Jesus. They were water baptized. That's their baptism in water. Verse 15, when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. In Acts 8, you have all three baptisms happening in the life of people. Baptized into Jesus for salvation. Baptized into water. The old life is gone. The new life has come and baptized into the Holy Spirit when Peter and John lay hands on them. Acts 10, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Acts 2, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent, which is salvation, let every one of you be baptized, which is water baptism, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is spirit baptism, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Again, watch the threefold instruction of Acts 2. Repent unto salvation, be baptized in water, old life has gone, new life has come, and then receive the gift of the Holy Spirit or be empowered for a supernatural life by God. When you are saved, you are baptized into Christ. When you are baptized into water, the old you gets cut off. When you are baptized in the Spirit, now you get the power to walk in that new life that God has granted you. When I get baptized in the Spirit, I receive the power to act in accordance to what I've already legally been declared to be. When I get baptized in the Spirit, I receive power to be a witness. When I get baptized in the Spirit, there's a fresh anointing that comes upon my God-given gifts and my natural talents. Watch the pattern in the New Testament. 1 John 5, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the spirit, Holy Spirit baptism, the water, which is water baptism, and the blood, which is salvation. And all these three agree as one. Did you know that this pattern exists in the Old Testament as well? Watch what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10. Moreover, moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers who were under the cloud all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Watch. 
brethren, I do not want you to be aware, unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud, which is the Holy Spirit. They all passed through the sea, which is baptism. They were all baptized into Moses. Moses being a type of Christ was salvation. In Exodus 31, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel. I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and in bronze, and cutting jewels for setting and carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. Hear me. The first individual to encounter God's Spirit in this manner was a designer named Bezalel. He was tasked with building the first tabernacle for God's presence to dwell. An artist with a mission to introduce a nation to the presence of God. That's what happens when ordinary people get filled with God's extraordinary spirit. It's not that this individual wasn't already a craftsman. It was that when the spirit of God fell on his life, it took him from being an ordinary artist to an anointed artist. I want you to watch this. Even in the Old Testament, this typology appears. Because I want to prove to you these three baptisms, not just from the New Testament, but also from the Old Testament. Watch the tabernacle that was being built. See this evening if you can identify the three types that are being demonstrated even in the architecture of the Old Testament tabernacle. In the Old Testament tabernacle, when you were to walk in, you had an altar where the blood of the lamb would be applied, speaking to salvation. You would have a bronze laver that was for cleansing, speaking to baptism. And you would have a flask of oil speaking to the Holy Spirit. All three were required before you rallied at the holy place. Even in the Old Testament, the typology of these three baptisms, the baptism of salvation, the baptism of water, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the oil of God, are even demonstrated in the architecture of the tabernacle. You must be washed in the blood, you must be baptized in water, and you have been invited to be baptized in His Spirit. Hear me, friend, the difference maker in your life is not trying harder. It's not being louder. It is not being prettier. It is not another promotion. The difference maker for you and I is being anointed by the Spirit of God. <clears throat> Anointing took five ordinary stones and made them lethal weapons in the hands of David. Anointing took an ordinary trumpet and made it a weapon of war in the mouth of Joshua. Anointing took an ordinary staff and made it a supernatural sign and wonder in the hands of Moses. Anointing is the partnership of God to man that results in his supernatural power being made manifest in and through your natural life. The Holy Spirit has many symbols attached to him throughout Scripture. He's likened to a dove, a flame, the wind, a lamp, a cloud, a river, a light, new wine. But maybe my favorite is, the, is that God's Spirit is like an oil that anoints. In the Old Testament, priests and kings would be anointed with oil on their heads to symbolize that they had been set apart for a specific task from God. Oil was also used for sprinkling the tabernacle and its furnishing to mark them as holy and set apart to the Lord. In fact, get this, anointing the head with oil was also a common activity for ancient shepherds. Do you know why? Because sheep could get their head caught in the briars or the sticker bushes and die trying to get untangled. Additionally, there were little flies that would like to torment sheep by laying eggs in their nostrils, which would turn into worms and drive the sheep to beat their head against a rock, sometimes to death. So the shepherd would anoint the whole head of the sheep with oil, and in doing so, give them peace and bring them healing. That oil formed a barrier of protection against the evil that tried to destroy the sheep. 
The Holy Spirit baptizes us into Jesus and into the body of Christ. The disciples baptized people into water and Jesus baptizes us into the Holy Spirit and his fire. Let me share with you tonight a few slides that I put together to further explain and then in just a moment we're going to take time to pray for people here in this environment. Number one, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a term used to describe an experience distinct from salvation by which the Holy Spirit enables believers to commune with God in a new and personal way and empowers them for service. It is what Jesus tells his disciples to wait for in Jerusalem prior to the rise of the New Testament church. Acts 1, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Well, how do you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, it's simple. You just ask for it. Luke 11, the verse we started with tonight. Everyone who asks, receives. Jesus actually uses the analogy of a normal father-son relationship. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, would give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, would give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? What happens when people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, oftentimes people pray in tongues as a tangible manifestation of the inner experience of being baptized in the Spirit. In Acts 2, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Acts 10, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Acts 19, when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. What does it mean to pray in tongues? To pray in tongues is to, inspired by the Holy Spirit, speak words of an unknown language that only God understands. 1 Corinthians 14, for one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. Romans 8 and 26, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for when we know not what to pray as we ought, the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Somebody told me the other day that they didn't appreciate me praying in tongues, and I said, that's all right, I'm not praying to you. <clears throat> well, I don't understand what you're praying. That's the point. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. Well, why is it important for you to pray things that nobody else understands? Because when I pray in tongues, it confuses the hell out of the devil. It's one of the greatest gifts that God has given the believer. Is the baptism of the Holy Spirit for every believer? Yes, again, Scripture says that the Holy Spirit is accessible to anyone who asks. Well, what if they've only been saved for 30 minutes? The Holy Spirit is available to everyone who asks. Well, what if they're not completely perfect yet? The Holy Spirit is available to everyone who asks. What if they got a speeding ticket on the way to church? The Holy Spirit is available to everyone who asks. And you know, the Holy Spirit will baptize people that you don't think are qualified just to tick you off. Does the baptism of the Holy Spirit happen after salvation or at salvation? Well, I think both end. Some people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit at the same time they receive salvation. Others receive at a later date. The only requirement is that you must be born again. 
For some people in this room, it's like, man, you grew up in a Christian family. You got born again right out of the womb. You were praying in times before you even knew how to speak in English. And that's kind of your life story. But for most people I meet, that's not their life story. And that's okay. They came to faith at a young age. Maybe they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit like at a youth camp or a night like this. Their life was endued with power from on high. They were set on an upward spiritual trajectory. All of a sudden, they had boldness attached to their witness. They had faith and fire attached to their prayers. It, it was like all of a sudden, their spirit got supercharged by the anointing of God in profound ways that caused them to operate as an otherworldly individual. You know, I, I grew up in, in, in a Christian family and I really genuinely did have a born again experience like at the age of five or, or, or six. Uh, I, I remember it like it was yesterday. I was at my, my grandmother's house in, in Sunnyside, Washington. She's now passed away, but I was living there for a season and um, I was convinced in that moment uh, that I had sin in my life, that that sin separated me from God, and I needed to make Jesus Lord and Savior of my life. And so at a young age, in a real genuine way, I gave my, my life to Jesus. Now, you know, we kind of grew up in a home where you kind of got to give your life to Jesus every three weeks just to make sure you're good, you know. So I prayed that prayer hundreds of times just to make sure if the rapture happens, I ain't getting left behind, you know what I mean? I've responded to more altar calls for salvation than you can count. <clears throat> but it wasn't until the age of 12 where I would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it was on a Sunday night service in Seattle at the church that I grew up at. And there couldn't have been more than 100 people in the room. And I don't even know if the pastor was teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But it was one of those environments that was just thick with anointing. Like where, where you know like God is everywhere for sure, but you're like God is somewhere tonight. Like he's here in the room. I could just sense him. And I felt like a longing in my spirit. And I had grown up in a, in a Pentecostal family, so I was used to being around people who I would hear pray in tongues. But it, it was something that like when I heard it, it would give me like this godly like zealousness and, and jealousy for the things of God. Like I, I, I knew that there was something like more for me in my life and, and, and I wanted that more. And so I responded to, to the altar call and like nobody told me what to say or how to do it or how I was supposed to perform. I was only 12, but there was uh, our young adult pastor, a, a gal, and, and, and uh, she, she came over and, and, and laid her hands on me and just prayed a simple prayer. And I can't explain what happened because when the Holy Spirit baptizes you, it confounds your, your, your ability to wrap your intellect around it. And here's the reason why. Because when God does something so profound in your life that your intellect can't create a box for it, what it means is that you can't deconstruct it because you didn't create it. <laughs> you didn't fabricate it. This wasn't something like you research and you passed a test and all of a sudden somebody said, well, you're baptized in the Holy Spirit now. Like it was an experience unlike anything I've, I've ever had, had before. It felt like hot oil came on my head. Uh, it felt like I had grabbed a hold of like a 220 electrical current. My whole body began to shake. I didn't have human words for what was happening, but I knew in that moment it was more profound than I would realize. And at the age of 12, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> God filled me. I prayed in tongues. <clears throat> and what it began is a lifelong journey of pursuing him that has led to this very moment tonight. Let me answer some of the questions that I get asked most often. People say, if, if I don't speak in tongues, do I still have the Holy Spirit? Yes. The Holy Spirit dwells, hear me, within every believer from the moment of salvation onward. Watch what Jesus tells his disciples in John 20. This is before Acts 2. This is before the day of Pentecost. And when Jesus had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus breathes on you and says, receive the Holy Spirit, you ain't arguing yourself out of that. In that moment, they are receiving the Spirit of God. But watch. So if I already have the Holy Spirit, then why do I need this? Jesus says the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to receive power to be a witness to his reality. The baptism of the Holy Spirit better equips us as believers to be effective in the Great Commission. After John 20, where Jesus breathes on his disciples and receives his Holy Spirit, 
A few days later, as recorded in Acts 1, he tells them, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. So either Jesus forgot about what happened in John 20 or there was something additional that he wanted his spirit to accomplish in the lives of his disciples. So sometimes people will say, well, you know, they say if I don't speak in tongues, I don't have the Holy Spirit. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. When you give your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit seals you under the final day of salvation. He moves in and every demon moves out because a house divided against itself cannot stand and God will not share the room of your heart with any other lesser idol. The Holy Spirit moves in and seals you for the day of salvation. However, there is something subsequent and secondary referred to by Jesus as the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and he tells his disciples to wait for this. In theological terms, we differentiate these two experiences using these words, indwelling versus infilling. Indwelling refers to the act of the Holy Spirit becoming residential in the life of a believer upon confession of faith. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit moves in. Ephesians 3, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. This is indwelling. When you get born again, the Holy Spirit indwells inside of you. However, infilling refers to the secondary act of the Holy Spirit baptizing or filling the life of a person after their confession of faith. After you get saved, God invites you into a deeper experience with his Holy Spirit. Acts 2 and 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Somebody on Instagram DM me today. They said, doesn't Paul say that not everyone speaks in tongues? I'm like, yeah, he absolutely does. But unless you understand the context of what Paul is communicating, you'll reach all sorts of bizarre conclusions. Let me explain it. Does Paul say that not everyone speaks in tongues? The context is key. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul is speaking about the gift of tongues as a public phenomenon that combined with an interpretation is meant to edify the church body. He is explaining that not everyone is gifted to voice a public message in tongues, which is meant to be followed by an interpretation in a public local church context. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 12, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. What if I don't have the gift of speaking in tongues? That's okay. Not everyone is necessarily gifted to speak in tongues in a public capacity followed up by a public interpretation. However, every believer has the ability to pray in the Spirit. So does Paul say not everyone can speak in tongues? He absolutely does say that. But the context is key. Paul is addressing the gift of public tongues and public interpretation. Mark 16, watch what Jesus says. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. It does not say these signs will accompany those who pass a spiritual gift test or these signs will accompany some certain people who are extraordinarily gifted by God, but not everybody has the gift. So make sure that you tell them not everybody has the gift before praying for them. He says these signs, these are the words of Jesus. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons and they will speak in new tongues. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul follows it up saying, now I want you all to speak in tongues. Well, Paul, I thought you just got done telling us not everybody speaks in tongues. The context is key. It's just like the ability for you and me to pray for somebody who is sick and to see them healed. 
Does that mean that you have a public gift of healing that will turn into a healing ministry like John G. Lake or some of the other legends of church history? No, not necessarily. But do you need to ask God if you have the gift of healing before praying for somebody who is sick? No, because the scriptures say these are the signs that will accompany those who believe. I pray for people who are sick all the time and see them healed. I don't know if that means that I have the public gift of healing, but I do have the birthright inheritance of healing because I am a follower of Jesus. Now let me help explain public versus private gift. Think about a man by the name of William Hung who rose to fame on one of my favorite shows, American Idol. Now I don't like American Idol as much anymore because the guy who was always most salty on the show, Simon, is no longer on the show. Every person they highlight has an incredible Hallmark story. They got ran over by a horse when they were three years old. They lost half an arm and now they found a new passion to sing. And I didn't watch American Idol for the success stories. I watched American Idol for the horror stories. (laughs) And William Hung was the best horror story that ever existed. A man who could not sing if his life depended on it could not hit the right key or the right tone if his life depended on it. But he rose to internet fame, not because of how good he was, but because of how bad he was. Now watch, does William Hung have a public gift for singing? Probably not. And every once in a while we get a William Hung worship audition. Bless God. Does William Hung have a private ability to sing whenever and wherever he wants? Most definitely. Do you have a public gift for tongues and interpretation? Maybe. I'm not the giver of gifts. He is. But do you have a private ability to pray in the spirit whenever and however you want? Most definitely. So you've got to understand the difference in Paul's teaching between a public gift and a private ability. It's like everybody's a rock star singing on the biggest stage when they're in the shower. If I walk by your bathroom and I hear you singing in the shower, I'm not gonna wait for you to get out of the bathroom and criticize you and ask, well, did you really have that gift? I'm not sure, I just, I don't want you to do it if you don't really have a public gift for it because I'm just everybody else's fruit inspector and I've just got to make sure that you, that you really have a public gift because, you know, the Bible said not everybody has that gift and if we act like everybody has that gift then everybody's going to be faking it because not, not everybody has that gift. I'll just say, well, listen, the Bible says make a joyful noise unto the Lord. That was joyful. It wasn't pretty, but it was joyful. Do you got a private ability to sing in the shower? Yes, you do. And for some of you, it should stay as a private ability the rest of your life. But all of a sudden, somebody tries out, they get on the worship team, and you're like, man, that wasn't just a private ability, that's a a public gift. There's something different on that. There's there's something extra on that. And when Paul is teaching on tongues, he is differentiating between the public gift and the private ability. Now, this is gonna be important for you. Is the private usage of tongues a gift of the Holy Spirit or a function of the Holy Spirit? I believe that speaking in tongues is a function of the Holy Spirit, a birthright for all believers. In Mark 16, Jesus told his disciples, these signs will follow those who believe. Every believer is invited to have these signs follow them. I don't need a public gift of tongues in order to privately pray in the Spirit just as I don't need a public worship ministry in order to privately sing praises to God as scripture commands. The Bible commands people to praise God everywhere, to sing God, sing to God everywhere, to pray without ceasing. I don't necessarily need a public gift or a public stage to follow through with the commands of scripture. 
another critique that people often levy against the Pentecostal movement is they'll say this, well, every time somebody prays in tongues, there needs to be an interpretation. Well, that depends. Scripture says that if a public message in tongues is given in the context of a church service, an interpretation is needed. 1 Corinthians 14, when you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at the most three should speak one at a time, and someone must interpret. However, a majority of the time, speaking or praying in tongues happens in a semi-private setting, a prayer meeting, personal devotion, worship time. In such settings, a public interpretation is not needed since the tongue isn't intended as a public message. The problem for the Corinthian church was that its members were giving public messages in tongues without public interpretations. But sometimes people who are not well qualified to teach on the subject as a critique, anytime that their radar ears pick up on maybe somebody potentially praying in tongues, you know, they'll go, well, that's out of order. That's out of order. That's out of order because there doesn't need to be, there, there isn't a public interpretation. And it was like, this is an A-B conversation. See yourself out. I wasn't talking to you. Just because you're nosy don't mean I need a public interpretation. Okay, now if I were to get on the mic tonight and for the next five minutes speak in tongues straight, there would need to be a public interpretation because it's for the edifying of the church. As I'm praying for people at the altar and I'm praying in tongues, I'm doing so to build myself up in the most holy faith. And in doing so, I'm encouraging you to pray in your God-given birthright prayer language that I believe is a function for every New Testament believer. That doesn't require a public interpretation. So do tongues require an interpretation? Again, the context is key. If it's meant or given or intended as a public message, then it needs to be a public, there needs to be a, a public interpretation. The problem with the Corinthian church is it was chaotic, out of order. See, everybody was coming to church and they were all trying to showcase their giftedness. So somebody had a hymn over here, somebody else had a scripture over here, somebody else had a word of wisdom over here, three or four people had a, uh, had a, had a gift of tongues somewhere in the audience, and everybody was trying to compete for attention. They were all doing it at once, and it was just causing chaos. So Paul writes them as an apostolic father, and he sets instruction. And he says, listen, in the context of a church service, things got to be done decently and in order. And if everybody's trying to showcase their giftedness all at once, it don't help anybody because church is not some weird kind of talent show where people just get to spout off. It's meant for the edifying and the building up of the believers who gather. Now watch. Can every believer speak in tongues? Yes. Must every believer speak in tongues? No. God won't force you to pray in tongues. He won't force you to do nothing. It's not a requirement for salvation, but God does invite every believer into the experience of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. If I've already received the Holy Spirit, can I be refilled? Yes, and you should be. Paul says we should be continually filled with the Spirit. Even if you have already received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, God is always willing to give you a fresh filling if you ask. Ephesians 5 and 18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but instead be filled, continually filled with the Spirit. Acts 4.31, recording an event that happened after Pentecost, the Bible speaking of the same disciples who were just filled in the upper room. Two chapters later, what happens? And when they prayed, the place in which they gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Two chapters after a wind blew into the room and fire sat on their heads. What happens? Again, these believers are refilled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. What does this all mean? I'm glad you asked. I might not have the public gift of presenting a message in tongues to a local church, but if I want it, I do possess the private function of praying in the Spirit in my personal life. And if I have already received at an earlier point in my life, God can fill me anew with His Spirit any time I ask. What will it look like when I receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? God won't force you to do nothing. He will not reach inside your mouth and move your tongue for you. It is a function activated by our faith. 
That's what sometimes people expect or anticipate. God going to reach up through their stomach into their mouth like a, a sock puppet. And he going to move their tongue. They're like, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. I mean, that would be like me getting up here to preach on Sunday night and saying, well, I didn't prepare no notes and I'm not going to say anything. God, I'm just waiting for you to force me to preach. Here I am. Ah. Ah. Well, I guess Lord didn't have a message for people tonight because God didn't force me. You know, people develop this theology of, well, if God wants me to have it, then he'll kind of force me to have it as a way to give them a convenient excuse to not contend for anything spiritual. So they, they hide behind like this theological paradigm, which really is just a cheap excuse to cause them to always have a way out of not contending or pressing in for the things of God. Well, if God wanted me to have it, he'll just give it to me. I'm not going to do nothing. I'm not going to move. I'm not going to worship. I'm not even going to attend. I'm not going to show up. I'm going to have a bad attitude the whole time. I have no faith. And look, God didn't do it, which means it's not for everybody because I didn't get it. Well, listen, you so sour and negative, the Spirit of God just hop right over you. No, it's a function activated by faith. Just like when I preach, it's a function activated by faith. Just like when I pray, just like when I worship, just like when I prophesy, it's a function activated by faith. If you're waiting for God to take you over like some sort of Elon Musk autonomous robot and all of a sudden force you to move and things like that, you know what? That sounds a lot more like demonic possession than it does Holy Spirit and filling. It's a function activated by your faith. It is not the Holy Spirit taking over and violating your free will. When you decide to pray in tongues or prophesy or witness, you are partnering with the Holy Spirit in faith. You are making a conscious decision to pray in an unknown language. 1 Corinthians 14 and 14, Paul says this, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Somebody asked me, they said, well, do you know what you're praying when you pray in the Spirit? I said, no, absolutely not. The Bible says pray in your understanding and pray in the Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but like when I pray, maybe it's ADHD or whatever it is, but after about 45 seconds of praying in English, I've prayed for everybody in the known world and every single issue. I pray for all the missionaries. I pray for all my enemies and precatory prayers. I've prayed for all of the things. Yeah, I prayed for every single issue that I have about 45, 60 seconds in. That's just my attention span, and I talk fast. So when I pray, I got about a minute of English. <laughs> but the Bible says, when you know not how to pray, pray in the Spirit. And so praying in the Spirit allows me to directly communicate with God. And the Bible says, I'll get to this in a moment, but when you pray in the Spirit, you pray the perfect will of God. Which means when I don't know how to pray, I want to pray exactly what God wants me to pray. So I'm going to pray in my spirit. It's a gift that's activated by my faith. Do you know sometimes I don't even feel spiritual when I pray in the spirit? It's not something that has to be just the right atmosphere and the air's got to be at 71.3 degrees and the worship team has to be playing my favorite Hillsong album and I've got to be in my special chair with my Bible folded out, my Diet Coke, and it's just, and the setting's got to be right. The setting's got, I've got to feel it. I've got to feel it. I've got to feel it. You pray in the spirit long enough, you'll feel it. I can promise you that. I can promise you that. Next time you're stuck in traffic, you pray in the spirit. <laughs> I'll tell you, sometimes I'll be watching a scary movie. I'll be praying in the spirit. I'll be binding, canceling, <laughs> casting things out. <laughs> you don't have to feel spiritual to pray in the spirit. But what I've realized is God's a lot more interested in talking to me than at times I'm interested in talking to him. So when I pray in the spirit, it activates that interior thing inside of me and I'm communicating directly to God. <laughs> Let me hit these real quick and then we'll go end. Eight reasons why you should desire to speak in tongues. Number one, we just hit this. Speaking in tongues helps you pray the perfect will of God. Romans 8. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. That means this. God searches your heart. God knows the mind of the Holy Spirit because it's one God made manifest in three persons. And when you know not how to pray, the Spirit intercedes through you on behalf of others. Speaking in tongues helps you pray the perfect will of God. Number two, speaking or praying in tongues edifies and strengthens your inner man. 1 Corinthians 14, 4. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves. 
feeling beat down, feeling tempted, feeling overwhelmed by life, feeling anxious, feeling depressed, stressed out, feeling like you're about to go back to an old habit, you're facing fear, you know what you do? You pray in the spirit. Why? Because it builds up your inner man. It edifies, encourages yourself. You know, a lot of Christians never graduate out of the most immature phase of their spirituality. Immaturity requires everybody else to be the chief encourager for you. Spiritual maturity is like what David did. He anointed himself and encouraged himself in the Lord. Well, if I could just dial a pastor at 3 a.m., don't be calling me. You can encourage yourself. You can build yourself up. You know, when we're doing that rally at the UW last week and people are screaming at me and I've got death threats on my phone. They put posters. It was kind of a cool picture. They put posters of my face, Antifa all over town. They said, come comrades, prepare to do violence. <laughs> you know what I'm doing when I'm standing on that camp? I'm praying in the spirit. God has not given me the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Well, I'm edifying myself. I'm building myself up. You can pepper spray me, cuss me out, call me every name in the book. I've already built myself. I've encouraged myself in the Lord. I've edified myself. I've strengthened myself in the Lord. I've anointed myself. I'm coming prepared for the battle, prepared for the fight. I'm not coming to lean on your strength or your understanding. I'm leaning on his strength, his understanding. I'm praying in the spirit. I'm exercising that inner spiritual man. Now, I love the times, too, where the Lord will put a word on somebody else's heart. He'll speak right to your circumstance, things of that nature. But I think sometimes, if we're to be honest in the charismatic movement, we have become so over-reliant on somebody else giving us a word or giving us an encouragement. Man, if I don't get a word tonight, I don't know if I can come back. I just really need somebody to help me. And can I tell you, the Spirit is more than interested in helping you. <clears throat> you pray in the Spirit, the Lord will cause you to be edified and built up. Reason number three. Speaking in tongues helps strengthen you in areas of personal weakness. Romans 8 and 26. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Speaking in tongues helps strengthen you in areas of personal weakness. I would encourage you, the next time you're facing the temptation, pray in the Spirit. The next time you're feeling drawn to that destructive behavior, pray in the Spirit. The next time you feel like, man, I'm about to give in to that thing that God rescued me out of and I swore I was never going to go back to it, but man, I had a really hard day at work and I had a fight with a friend or an argument with a spouse and I'm just feeling like drawn back to this thing, praying to spirit. It'll help set up a safeguard in areas of personal weakness in your life. Reason number four, one of my favorites, praying in tongues builds and increases your faith. Jude 1 and 20, but you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Oftentimes when I'm praying for people at the altar, I'll pray a little bit in English, I'll pray a little bit in tongues. What I'm doing is I'm building myself up in faith. Why? Because as I'm praying, what's happening is what's called impartation. I am pouring out of that which Christ has poured into me. Now, by the time that I get to a Sunday night service, it's like the sixth or seventh time I've preached on a Sunday, which means I'm pretty tired, which means I feel like I have a hangover, even though I didn't drink nothing. <laughs> Feels like, what day is it? What year is it? Where am I? Where's my pants? What am I wearing? What am I doing? Who's here? Who's not here? I need to be built up. Why? Because I can't pour out from an empty vessel. That which I receive from the Lord, I give to you. So I'm building myself up in the most holy faith. Why? Because I want to impart something of value into your life. And Jude writes this to the church. Build yourself up in your most holy faith by praying in the spirit. Number five, praying in tongues is a command from scripture. Ephesians 6 and 18. Pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray in the spirit on all occasions. On all occasions. Which means any day is a good day to pray in the Spirit. Reason number six, praying in tongues is a sign to the unbeliever. Supernatural signs and wonders always help point people to Jesus. 1 Corinthians 14 and 22. Tongues then are a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. Now you might say, well, that's strange. If an unbeliever walked in and heard somebody speaking in tongues, they'd probably be so freaked out. Like, what did I walk into? This crazy church and... 
What are they doing? Snake handling, praying in weird languages. What's going on? No, what I found is that when somebody who don't know God walk into a spirit-filled environment and they hear somebody else speaking in tongues, spirit speaks to spirit. All of a sudden, something begin to rise up inside of them. And they're like, I don't know what this is, but I'm curious and I'm interested. And maybe I'll stick around a little bit longer. Hopefully somebody can explain this. And there's just something that's happening in this environment in this moment. I, I, I don't know exactly what, but there is something on that that feels otherworldly. Tongues is a sign to the unbeliever. I, I had this experience when I was ministering uh, in the nation of, of, of Japan. We had just got done with an afternoon service. We were doing services three times a day for like five days in a row in a church uh, uh, in Japan. And people were coming, getting touched by God, getting born again. And uh, at the end of our afternoon service, I'd preached my voice raw, prayed for everybody I knew how to pray for, uh, literally didn't have nothing left in the tank. And I, I had talked so much, even the interpreter was worn out. He was standing there just looking defeated, you know, like, I please don't say anything else. I've got nothing left, you know. And uh, I don't speak nothing in Japanese, you know, not even a little bit. I, I barely speak English, let alone Japanese. I don't, I don't speak it. And there was this young gal that came up and at the end of the service, and, and she, she kind of motioned to me that she wanted prayer. And I looked over at my interpreter, and he was like, you got this on your own, man. I just, like, I got nothing left. And so I'm like, well, this guy ain't going to understand nothing I'm praying for anyways. And so I just laid my hands on her and began to pray and, 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 and speak in tongues, pray in the Holy Ghost. And uh, about 30 seconds in, she started to like violently shake and cry, like weep. And I'm like, oh man, Holy Spirit must be praying a real good prayer because I don't know what I'm saying, what I'm doing. I'd love to take credit for this, but, but uh, you know, I don't even know what's happening and and I stopped praying and all of a sudden, really excited, she starts talking to the interpreter. And the interpreter turns to me and he says, have you ever studied Japanese? And I go, no. <laughs> you know, I took like 10 years of Spanish and I, I don't have nothing, you know, from even that. I, I said, no. And, she's, she, and this gal is freaking out and she says to my interpreter, she says, how did this pastor from America know and speak in the fluent dialect of the village that I grew up in. <laughs> Tongues are a sign for the unbeliever. Now that experience has only happened, I believe, twice uh, in my life. It happened an additional time um, when I was ministering on, on an Indian reservation. But um, although that's not the normative experience for my life, You've got to recognize that the Lord uses supernatural signs to pique the curiosity of people, to draw them into the canopy of his grace. This is what happens in Acts 2. They're waiting in the upper room, 120 of them. All of a sudden, the wind blows. They're like, nobody turn on the AC. I don't know what's happening. They start to look around. They're like, your head's on fire. And they're like, no, no, your head's on fire. Everybody's head's on fire. Like, man, this is wild. Uh, and then all of a sudden, they begin to speak in, in, in tongues. And what happens? A crowd gathers because they think the disciples are drunk. And Peter gets up and preaches. He's like, guys, it's 9 a.m. It's too early to be drunk. Um, this is not the wine of the flesh. This is the new wine of the spirit. And in fact, this is what Joel prophesied. In the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. And so it was the curiosity of the sign that drew in the unbeliever. They stood there as Peter preached, 3,000 got saved and the New Testament church got planted. And so this is why I'm not embarrassed of charismatic signs and wonders and miracles because I'm not trying to explain his power. I'm trying to demonstrate his power. If you will demonstrate his power, God will explain his power, okay? Let me give you two more. We're gonna end. Reason number seven, praying in tongues allows you to communicate with God even when your mind is messy. First Corinthians 14 and 14, for if I pray in tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Reason number eight, Praying in tongues is speaking directly to God. 1 Corinthians 14 and 2. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but instead to God. It's a direct line, direct access. You're praying the perfect will of the Father. How does it happen? John 7. On the last day and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Remember, Jesus tells his disciples, I must go to my Father that I may send another, my Spirit. He will be your helper. 
He will lead you, guide you into all truth. He will empower you for the work of the ministry. Jesus prophesied this all the way back in John 7. Those who believe will receive. Out of their innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Jesus spoke these things concerning the Holy Spirit. Two objections. Number one. These are the objections I hear for people when they talk about baptism of the Holy Spirit. You're just doing that yourself. Yeah, no duh. Thank you, Sherlock. You have uncovered the greatest theological mystery of all time. Congratulations. Yeah, that's how prayer works. If God is forcibly causing words to come out of your mouth against your will on a regular basis, you're probably demonized. Number two, how do I know if I got the right thing? Because we asked for the right thing. And God guaranteed that we wouldn't get the wrong thing if we asked for the right thing. <laughs> Last slide. How can it happen for me? Ask, pray, and believe in faith that God is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. There isn't a formula, there's just faith. So let's pray and let's believe. I've done my best to uh, address um, out of the scriptures the practical nature, the historical nature. I believe the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for today. Uh, I think in total I've referenced it maybe over 70 or 75 verses. This is not just like me repeating doctrine from like a church notebook or a manual somewhere that I, that I discovered. These are what the scriptures communicate. And I'm, I'm simply here to tell you what the text says. Now, what you do with it is, is your problem, not mine. But, but I, I am here to encourage you to receive everything that God, that God has for you. One of the things that I have dealt with for a, a long time, and it comes in waves, is like um, uh, the ability to like not be able to like fall asleep at like normative times. It don't matter like how tired I am, I'll get home at the end of like a Sunday night and I'll be like, I'm exhausted. And next thing I know, it's like 3 a.m. And I'm like, I, I've got to sleep at some point. <laughs> so what I started to do, which is probably not super healthy, but what I started to do at, at nighttime is um, I would watch uh, infomercials. And not because I ever bought anything from an infomercial, but because I was fascinated with the way that they communicated. And I had like an entire metric sheet of like my favorite like infomercial guys. There was like the Australian dude, you know, who was always selling like sponges. And then there's, remember the OxyClean guy? The OxyClean guy, like, I've never seen somebody so turned up on detergent, you know? And I was like, I love this dude's passion, you know? And, and then there was the other guy, I forget what his name was, but, it, but it, he was the guy who made the crock pot and his tagline was like, set it and forget it, you know? And they always did these like side-by-side -side comparisons, like come back in 30 minutes, you have this beautiful meal prepared. And, and I was just always like so interested and engaged in these, these infomercials. And, and I would watch them like, like religiously. And there was always a tagline that every single infomercial dude would use, regardless of the product they were selling. And it would always get to the end of the infomercial, the 30 minute segment, and they would say, call this number right now. It's on the bottom of your screen. You can make four easy payments, we'll split it up. This revolutionary product's gonna change your life. You'll be the happiest you've ever been. They have all these testimonial videos. It's very interesting just from a sociological perspective to watch. And, and so I'm watching all these guys, but they always had the same tagline at the end. But they would say this, but wait. There's more. If you call right now, in the next five minutes, we will double your offer. And then we will double it again. And you won't have to pay for shipping. And it'll be at your house in 24 hours. And it's gonna be incredible. You thought it was good now. But if you call in the next 10, but wait, there's more. And I was watching like these infomercials for like a few weeks, like trying to like, rewire my brain to get to sleep on a normal time. And like in the middle of it, you know how God would just speak to you on the most funny stuff? Like you're not even trying to like have a spiritual moment and God would just make it a spiritual moment. And then you'll find yourself convicted. You're like, why am I crying watching an infomercial, you know? <laughs> By the scrub daddy. And I'm just like weeping watching the infomercial. Oh God. <laughs> but here's what got me. Here's what got me. As this guy here is on the infomercial, they always had that wireless mic, you know, that came down. 
the guy who was always chopping, you know, chopping vegetables, bop, 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 bop. I never been fascinated by a guy chopping like that so much. I was enthralled, you know. And as I'm watching it, and these guys are speaking right to the television audience, having all these testimonials of people whose lives were changed by the, you know, crock pot that they sold and all these types of things. And he gets up there and he uses that famous tagline, but wait, there's more. And like right, right in the middle of it, the Spirit of God speaks to me. And he's like, Russell, this is my heart for believers. But wait, there's more. <laughs> and that's my heart for you tonight. But wait, friend, there's more. There's more. I give my life to Jesus. Like I'm reading my Bible sometimes. I'm even showing up to church like, like once a month and I'm like doing the thing. And like I'm here as a friend whose life has been transformed by the power of God's spirit. And I am pleading with you by the mercy of God, which is in Christ Jesus. But wait, there's more. The baptism of the Holy Spirit will mess you up. It'll be the most disruptive experience outside of salvation in your life. It'll cause you to be sensitive to the Lord. It'll make you cry and weep in his presence. It'll give you a fresh conscience and a new heart. It'll make you sensitive to his voice. All of a sudden, you'll be in prayer moments and, and all of a sudden, somebody's name will come to your mind and you can't stop thinking about them. You'll call them on the way home and they'll be like, dude, it's so crazy that you're calling me right now. I was contemplating taking my life tonight and I told the Lord, if you'll just have somebody reach out, then I'll live another day and I'll give my life to you. The Holy Spirit will mess you up. You'll start to have dreams and see visions. You'll start to hear his voice in more clear ways than you've ever heard it before. He'll possess you with a vision, a dream, and a destiny to do something about the fractured world that you find yourself living in. He'll give you a great compassion and care and concern for the harvest field that is around you. Your heart will break for the things that break his heart. Your heart will rejoice that, at the things that causes his heart to rejoice. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is, is, again, one of the most disruptive things that you will ever experience in your life. But listen, the Holy Spirit don't play games. This is not like, you know, I'm, I guess I'm just here, get, get me a little add-on to my faith and like go back the same. No, I'm telling you, if you're hungry tonight, if you're asking, if you're seeking, you're knocking, the God of heaven will pour this out on you. But let me warn you, your life will never be the same. And it will be beautiful, but it will never be the same. And what you will find in your life is this insatiable hunger for the things of God that causes you not to be able to sit through a dry, dead religious service or worship a dry, dead God in a non-anointed worship environment. It'll make you hungry for His power hungry for his presence. It will create a deep yearning in your heart for the things of God. It'll mess you up in the most beautiful way. And if you want it, it's here for you tonight. Would you stand as we close? And hey, we're going to pray for people tonight and Essentially, in this room tonight, there are three categories of people. Category A is this. You don't know Jesus, but you want to know Jesus. You want a connection with this God who offers you way more than you deserve. You need to get born again. That's category A. Category B, there's people here tonight. You've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. You've been filled before, but you know tonight, hey, if there's an option or an opportunity for me to be refilled, sign me up. Option three, there's people here tonight like the disciples in Ephesus who are saying to themselves or thinking to themselves, I never even heard a message like this. I've been raised in church my whole life and I've never heard a message like this. But I want everything that God says I can have and I'm hungry tonight for the things of God. And if you're in any of those three categories in just a moment, we're gonna make time to pray for you. Now, 
Altar area is not very big, but my commitment tonight is we'll stay as long as it takes to pray for everybody who wants to receive prayer. But we're going to pray for people at the altar. We're also going to have people working the room, praying for people who are in their seats. And what I've told the prayer team is that if somebody is staying in the service, staying in worship, after the altar call is given, wherever they're standing, they're a target. (laughs) So you won't get anointed with oil whether you like it or not. So just prepare yourself. But we're going to pray the prayer of faith. And here's how it's going to look. Just, just let me explain it to you because I don't, I mean, we do weird stuff, but I don't do like manipulative stuff. Like, I just want to like clearly explain how this is going to look because I don't want you to feel forced. I do want you to feel hungry, but I don't want you to feel forced. <clears throat> Prayer team, including myself and others, we're going to lay hands on people. We're going to pray for you. We're going to pray a simple prayer. Father, thank you for this person. Thank you for their life. Thank you for what you're doing inside of them. We thank you that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the promise of the Father. And God, you always make good on your promises. So God, tonight I pray that you would baptize my friend with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That tonight would be a night that they never forget. In Jesus' name, amen. Now after they say amen, what I've instructed them to do is to begin to pray not with a public tongue, but with a private tongue to pray in the Spirit. And as they pray in the Spirit, I'm going to ask you to pray in the Spirit. Well, what do you mean? Like, how's that going to look? Or how's it going to work? It's probably going to start off with you sounding real stupid. Is that, that's how it's going to work. You know, when I started praying in tongues at the age of 12 at an altar at a church service in Seattle on a Sunday night, you know how it sounded? It sounded like a car that couldn't start. Really? So he goes, sis, 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 I was like, I, is this it? I, is it? Is it? I, and the gal who was praying for me was like, there it is. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. And pretty soon it turned into sababa, rututu, shukoratata, bababasi. And the Holy Spirit filled me. It'll happen for you tonight. It'll happen for you tonight. I can promise you, it'll happen for you tonight. And can I tell you, sometimes when people get baptized in the Holy Spirit, it feels very spiritual. People fall, shake, cry, rattle, roll, jump, scream, do whatever. And sometimes people just stand there and just receive. It looks pretty normal. I don't care how it looks for you. I just want you to be filled. (laughs) But I'm going to encourage you. you got to use your faith tonight, friend. Well, Pastor, I was expecting all the tingles and all the goosebumps. And, like, I was thinking I'd see an angel feather floating in the sky. And, you know, it just felt like somebody laid their hands on me and prayed. And I just was, like, started. And awesome. Great. Really cool. That's God's kindness being demonstrated towards you. And I want you to experience all that God has for you tonight. It's a promise from the Father, but it's activated by your faith. And after me or an altar worker or a pastor or a leader prays for you, we're going to pray in English, but then we're going to transition. We're going to pray in the Spirit. And as they begin to pray in the Spirit, guess what? It serves as your invitation to begin to pray in the Spirit. And can I tell you, where it starts is not where it stops. You might sound like a car trying to start or a record starting to skip and it might feel weird, and you're like, what is, he- what is going on? I don't, is this it? Uh, but, uh, yeah. Just trust God. Use your faith and pray in the Spirit. Because guess what? That river that flows from within starts as a trickle and then turns into a stream and then turns into a more rapidly moving body of water and then eventually a full force river that's flowing from within. And I would just encourage you to receive. Take a big drink tonight and receive all of that which God desires for you. Well, is it going to sound weird? Yeah, it is. Absolutely. In Acts 2, they thought they were drunk. So you can either keep your dignity or you can receive God's spirit, but you can't do both. The decision is yours. And guess what? I know some of your stories in this room. You had no problem running your mouth when you was drunk. 
So don't be embarrassed to run your mouth when you get the new wine from God's Spirit tonight. I think the Holy Spirit is going to do it for you this evening. So here's what I'm going to do. When I count to three, I'm going to invite you to the altar. Again, my commitment is we're going to pray for everybody who's in here tonight. We're going to anoint with oil. It's not going to be necessarily super longest prayer you've ever heard in your life. But I'm going to encourage you. Listen, as you begin to get filled, I want you to get more bold, more loud. I want you to grow in your tenacity, grow in your courage. And I want you to pray in the Spirit until you begin to feel the wind of God blowing on you. God will fill you, I promise. God will fill you, I promise. It's the promise of the Father. Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I ask you now, pour out your Holy Spirit, young and old, Jew and Gentile, male and female, men servant and maid servant. God, I pray for an outpouring of your Spirit in Seattle, unlike anything that we have seen before. God, I pray tonight you would fill people from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet, that the wind of God's Spirit would take them over that the oil that comes from heaven would come upon their head. And in doing so, God, that you would endue them with power from on high to do the mission that God has created them uniquely to do. So we say, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, move. Holy Spirit, pour out. Holy Spirit, fill hungry hearts. Holy Spirit, unlock giftedness, power, miracles, signs, wonders. And tonight I pray that you would baptize a generation in the Pentecostal fire from Acts 2 all the way to 2024. To the God who changes not, do it one more time for the friends who are in this room this evening. When I count to three, come to the altar. If you can't make it to the altar, stay in your seat. We'll work our way through the seats. We'll pray for people tonight. Just watch God show himself strong. You're watching on the live stream. Maybe you're not able to be here tonight in person, but you know you need to receive. I want you to take your hand, place it on your head, and say, God, fill me now by your spirit. And I want you to begin to pray out in faith and watch the spirit of God fill you in your living room. Watch the spirit of God fill you wherever you're watching tonight. God will do it. It's the promise of the Father. Here we go, one. Here we go, two. Here we go, three. Come to the altar if you need prayer. If you can't make it to the altar, <clears throat> stay in your seat. We'll work our way around the seats, pray for people. But if you want prayer tonight to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, young and old, you've been saved for a day or saved for 40 years. Come to the table, come to the altar, come receive help in your time of need, come drink of his new wine, come eat of his new bread, come and receive from the Father of lights tonight. Come on, let's pray, let's believe.